Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and today our guest in the studio is Simon Park. Hi Simon. Hello Ian. And Simon is both a seeker and quite a prolific writer and I have four books in my hand that he's written over the last few years. It's The uh, Beautiful Life, a book about the Enneagram, we'll talk more about this later, Shelf Life, when he worked in a supermarket for three years, and his latest book, One Minute Mystic, which is quite fascinating, actually. And I'm going to actually start the programme by asking you, Simon, to read a page from One, Mi One Minute Mystic. And I've chosen one here I'm going to pass to you. So, okay. there you go. OK. Right, well, they're all nice and short. Um, this one's called Scribbles from Chuang Tzu's Notebook. Enjoy your work and the changing seasons. Avoid grand plans, just respond to things as they arise. Push your own self to one side, as far as you are able, so you can see other people more clearly. And instead of seeking fulfilment, seek only to be empty. This will create space for true understanding. Do not value power, but do value peace. It's okay to swing between joy and sadness, glory and failure. There's no great difference between them. Breathe slowly and listen for the order in the universe. There we are. And I feel with your pause there, you were actually listening for the order in the universe. Well, I was listening for the order in the universe, yeah. It's a nice thing to do, because I suppose I'm uh, quite quick to feel the disorder in myself, so it's nice just to pause and feel the order. I particularly like there, I, I like, I think, the, I, w I think whenever I read that, I always find a different line there for me, and the, the line for me today, I think, is not to seek fulfilment, but to seek to be empty. I think that's... Uh, that's where I am today with that one. That's, that's helpful for me. And what does seeking to be empty mean to you today? Um, well, I think it's... Uh, I, think, I think particularly... Um, in a way, being freelance, which I haven't been for much of my life, but I have been for the last three years of my life, is sort of brings out lots of survival fears in me. And, and you can get... You know, I can get busy trying to make plans, thinking how am I going to make some money tomorrow, so that sort of thing. So busily making plans, well actually um, plans don't really exist in any very substantial sense. And so the call to be empty for me today uh, is simply to, is to allow that space, you know, the space at the beginning of time before anything existed, out of which everything came. But actually everything comes from space, you know. So something comes from nothing, but nothing is prior to something. And uh, f it's quite easy to get trapped into believing that something creates something, but actually, no, nothing creates something, and something follows nothing. And so, to start with nothing is a good thing. Um, and it's it's an ancient teaching, but uh, it's easy to forget it. So I'm starting with nothing. That's I think that's that's what I'm that's what I'm feeling after reading that just now. I'm returning to nothing inside me. The nothing well, at the beginning of time. <laughs> And I'm just thinking in a very practical world, it's the day, the day, to, the date today is May the 7th, the day after the general election. Oh, that's true. And yeah. all the party leaders, the main ones, have actually started the day with nothing because uh, two of them hope to have a majority and here they are going to be negotiating and working incredibly hard to try and create something out of nothing in a way. Yes, well, the, ger the, the genius for them will be to try to establish an inner nothingness. I mean, sometimes what we call nothing is disappointment, and that, that is not the same as nothing. Um, but nothing inside is, is a peaceful place. Yes. Whereas if, if you're saying, oh, I got nothing out of that, that isn't the same. That's, that's, just, that's disappointment, that's rage, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of things. But it isn't, it isn't nothing because it isn't peaceful. So if maybe, maybe this weekend they'll, they'll be able to go away and be peaceful and start from that place of nothing and create something. 
No. Yes, and it's not a bad reference point, isn't it? No. Just to come back to yourself and just feel peace and nothingness yeah, and then see what, to see what creates, emerges. emerges. But it's a very threatening, I mean, nothing is a very, it is a threatening word to, to most people. I think it, sound, it, it sounds like nonsense. You know, if you talk about nothingness, people think, oh, that's a bit depressing. But of course, it's the opposite of depressing. It's the most creative thing because it's, you know, it's where the world came from. It's where everything came from, you know. Mm -hmm. It came from nothingness. But there's a, I think there's a, there's a, there's a fear in us, really, because I, I suppose, I suppose we're running away from so much that if the idea of actually being put into nothingness is rather exposing and frightening. Uh, but, uh, but maybe, maybe we're, we're unwise to think that. Maybe actually nothing is a very optimistic place, a rather hopeful place. So when you, when you wrote this book, the One Minute Mystic book, yeah. is that something that you kind of did in a fairly short space of time or was it just you wrote a bit now and again working towards it? Because there's a, a lot of real wisdom in this and you've divided it into, I think, nine different sections too. Well, I suppose, I suppose like, like these sort of books, it was, I suppose in, in a way it was written in six months, but in a way it was written over 25 years. I think that's, that's the, the truth of it. And you, cause you, you, I dredge back to things I've done, said, experienced, but then obviously actually working on the book and bringing them all together may take, you know, take, take six months or something. But I, I mean, I, in another way it took, you know, it took 25 years to write. That's, that's how I feel about it. Yeah. You can't, um, because you know wisdom isn't cheap it takes a, it's it's expensive and it's uh, it comes it comes from life it comes from experience yeah, it comes from experience and, yes life. and uh, you know it's, and uh, sometimes we think things that are happening they're really bad at the time and we don't want them and we resist them and then looking back at them we see actually something good and positive and, and we learn something from that situation yeah well that's right i mean and that's and it's usually something died probably i think because as much as we're drawn on by hope, we're also recreated by dismantlement, you know, by, by having things, by having icons or false gods, whatever it is, dismantled. Something in us, you know, has been dismantled, has had to die in order for us to, to move on somewhere. And, of course, that is, dying is never pleasant. Yes. Uh, it's never pleasant at the time. It never feels good. And so, but uh, it, it obviously is a very important part, you know. I was talking with someone who uh, came to see me yesterday who is experiencing the end of a relationship. I can see actually that it's good, actually it's good, it's going to be good for her, it's, I don't know what about the boy as well, probably be good for him as well, and it will, it will create something new and much stronger I think in her. But obviously you can't say that at the time, you, you've just got to live with the pain and say, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, that's... Uh, you have to stay with to, what's happening. You've got to stay with what's happening. Yeah. This is how I feel. Don't rush ahead. To, don't rush ahead and say, oh, I'm sure this is going to be a learning experience. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't do that. Don't kill it. Allow you. have just got to live the pain. You have to live yeah. the pain. And it's... Uh, and it's somehow, okay. I know this from myself in difficult situations, sometimes it's the mind saying, well, I won't be able to cope with this. I yeah. won't be able to stand this. But that isn't my experience at that moment right. because I can stand it. Yeah. I can cope with it. Now. I can be with it now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. So you're not... Yes, I mean, there are... I think people who, people who sort of function from their head more are, are, are very keen to look into the future and very, as you say, so what about this and what about that and think of every yeah. possibility that might happen. And obviously that's... Um, that's a particular sort of madness, as you say, because actually now, as you say, now, present here, now, I'm okay. And everything Absolutely. is perfect. You know, yeah. All is well. So I wanted just to look at the sequence of your life to yeah. see some of the journeys you've been on, because it's quite a fascinating, uh, fascinating life you've had, and obviously the different um, parts of it have contributed to the different books that you read. And you gave me some notes. I'm going to run through this as my yeah. guideline. Yeah. And when you were a child, often people on conscious TV we talk about their spiritual experiences when they were a child but you put down when you were a child you only wanted to be a footballer it's true I wanted to be George Best right I was a very fat child and he was he was apart from this he was really thin right and 
over the years that changed ironically but uh, <laughs> he became fatter and I became thinner but <laughs> which shows we shouldn't spend too much time thinking about our, our dreams but um, that's true I did only really want to be George Best I didn't I'd like to say my childhood was more spiritual than that but uh, that's about but what, what attracted apart from the apart from the physique of the body yeah. what attracted to you because he was he's incredible he daring was in... the daring the courage the, the, just yeah. the daring and the courage of the man that's what I like about it yeah uh, because people, I mean, those days, you know, cause in those days, people really tackled people because you can't do that nowadays. But uh, in those days, they got scythed down, no protection for the referee. And just the courage, he does the courage to get up and go on. I think that's what I liked about him the daring yeah. and the courage. Yeah. And he, and he had, he could do things that were at that time exceptional with the football. Well, he was very skillful as well. Uh, and he was very skillful as well. But I think probably for me the deep thing is the courage and yeah. the daring, because I, and I and I and, and that's something that, that has stayed with me. But of course he was, he was very gifted as well. And then you went on to Oxford University, yeah. And there you had a spiritual experience, which I think yeah. was quite difficult to start with. But then you saw life from a different perspective. It was well, it was strange. I was uh, I wasn't very happy. I have to. I wasn't very happy uh, at, at the uh, university, but. Um, I did, I, and, and, and in there, I remember, I remember sort of in my, in my little room, sort of, I don't know if I actually got on my knees, but I think I probably did actually, and sort of was crying out to the sky and saying, God, if you're there, what, what is this? And I woke up the next morning just feeling extraordinarily happy. Uh, and I had never felt anything sort of like that at all in my life. But what preempted that? How did you get to the stage I just, where you I were... think it was very, I felt really closed it's it's a very hard it's hard it's hard to describe it it's hard to describe it i think it was a, a sense of claustrophobia in the world probably uh nothing was giving me nothing was giving me pleasure nothing was giving me excitement nothing was warming my heart um and i saw it's a feeling of claustrophobia of it's closed isolation as well is it well isolation i can tend towards isolation as as, as, as a human being um I don't think I'm not sure how strong it was then in particular. Uh, I think it was just a sense of, is this it? You know, Bob Geldof's famous line, "Is this it?" But I think I think it was it was, it was that, and that nothing was nothing was making me happy. Um, and you know, on the face of it, I should have been happy. You know, I had lots going for me. Uh, University, well, whatever. It's right. You know, time, it's meant yeah. to be, you're meant to be out there and having yeah. a good time, and I was doing some interesting things, but. Um, uh, and but the, then the it's ex, the extraordinary experience of happiness the next day, and then for the next two days, I, this this great sense of of oneness with the world, which uh, I mean maybe maybe that does actually you know pick up on your saying were well, you feeling isolated? Maybe that was maybe, but maybe not maybe not maybe maybe separated was was a better word actually feeling separated from the world, feeling separated from anything that's good and life giving, uh, and. I woke up and the next two days I actually I couldn't walk anywhere. I had to run everywhere because I was so happy. Which, if you'd known me then, was w w w was an odd thing to see me doing. And uh, yeah, so I sort of I would run everywhere and I just felt this oneness, this oneness with the uh, with the world around me. I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't use the word oneness then because I that wouldn't have been a word on my radar. But uh, that's that's what it was. And uh, so it was a huge sense of joy, a huge sense of joy. And what did you feel had happened at the time? I don't know really. I, really, I found it very hard, I found it very hard to, um, to make anything of it. But I, I did link it with God though, I certainly linked it with God, because very soon after I felt, before I'd go to any church or cross, you know, you know, went through any church door, I felt I should become a priest. Again, okay. it was an odd right. thing. Right. I mean, I wasn't in a church, I hadn't, you know, anything, but I just felt I should become a priest. So obviously I linked this experience of oneness with the world with God in some way. Yeah. So I think your next stage was you worked in this youth club, the youth centre. Oh, that's right. Well, yeah, as a volunteer. You, worked, yeah, that's right. But, and, and you put in your notes that I wrote here that it's actually, it was a very violent but enlightening youth club. Yeah, well, it, it was, it was certainly very violent, you know, and, uh, you know, always getting attacked with sort of billiard cues and... Um, uh, you physically attacked? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Gosh. Yeah, and yeah, no, it was, it was... Um, it was uh, in uh, in London. It was a London club. It was in London, and I mean those days. And that's the, um, 
And that was good. My brother was a policeman, so um, he taught me sort of um, he taught me all the um, ways of hold, holding people and in order to defend yourself, that sort of thing. But uh, but it was yeah, it was. But it was also very. Uh, um, I think it dismantled a lot of. I think what it most dismantled was. I think what it most dismantled in me was 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 about about external appearances because what I I have ever since working there. I've never believed, you know, that, that there is such a thing as a swear word, because the only the only important thing when someone speaks to you is uh, is their intention, and of course some of the things that the people would say to me is there I won't repeat now, but they would be regarded as very very rude, very 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 rude, but they were spoken with such warmth. Oh, interesting. That actually this is fine. No, I'd like to say it now, but I won't say it now. But I, but it's some of the things that were said were said with such warmth. But actually, if you put if you printed them, yeah, you I think, my goodness entirely. me! Yeah. And of course, what you realise from that is that actually there's no such thing as a swear word. There is only the inner the inner intent. And some of the yeah. worst things that have been said to me, that have left me cold, have been polite words, but with pus in the eye, you know, uh, because the inner intention is, and you see that. Was that feeling of oneness? Did that stay with you through that time? Was that like a reference point for I you? I think it is. I think it was. I think um, I think it came. It came and it went. It came and it went. Um, I think like all, I think big experiences when they come, it's very hard to sustain. It's very hard to sustain them, but in a sense, they just they stain you in a way which you never recover from. Thankfully, they just there's a deep stain there um, of this experience of oneness and. Um, that did, that did, that did, and uh, uh, I mean, I felt huge. I felt a huge sense of oneness um, with with all the people I was working with. Um, you know, even if they were attacking me with a billy cue, yeah. you don't feel it at the time. You just feel frightened. But you know, on reflection, you think that's okay. So underneath, we're in this together. Yeah. Underneath is this realization that there's the interconnectedness. Absolutely. There's not actually a separation. No, there's no. Yeah. And it's very good because then. It's it is nice because then there are no enemies in the world. There are people you know, there are people you clash with, but then you withdraw, and you realise that you've been, you know, you've put up barriers and uh, they've put up barriers. But actually, they're not real barriers because you're one. See, I feel you play this down a bit because this is such a fundamental, deep understanding and realisation, and this is this presumably changed how you relate to people and how you lived your life. Um, it's a, it's a very big ch it is a very big change it is it is a very big change um, uh, because as soon as as soon as as soon as you are one there, there is there is no hierarchy and that's that's another thing you know you know like when I was you, you, in the in the church I think I always struggled with the whole hierarchy thing because when when you're all one anything that separates you from somebody else is a is a problem and if you're putting up a barrier between you. And if you're wearing robes and somebody isn't wearing robes, it can put a barrier between you, because that's, that isn't expressing the oneness. So I think my 20 years as a priest was always trying, was always wrestling with the oneness, and actually, is the church expressing this oneness, and how is it, you know, or, or actually is it separating? Um, so that, I mean, it, it, it creates problems. Uh, anything, anything that separates somebody from somebody else. You know, and you see it, you know, we've, as you said, we've just had an election campaign, of course, we go through the madness of labels, you know, uh, liberal Democrats, Labour, conservative, as if these actually expressed anything very substantial. They don't really express anything substantial, and of course, if you take away the labels, there's just lots of different human beings there, all struggling, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I mean, I think the oneness is, uh, is, is, is very, very big. Um, it's, it's also very peaceful, it's very peaceful. Because there are no enemies, there are no enemies. So you decided to uh, enter the priesthood. Yeah. Um, yeah and yeah. you were a priest for twenty priest years. For twenty years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, wonderful experience. Uh, it's just such a privilege to be given a chance to go and work, you know, in communities. And uh, it's very, you know, it's very hard work. It's very hard work. But um, uh, I did enjoy it. I'm, I mean, I'm a bit. I'm sort of. Temperamentally, I'm a bit of a hermit, and uh, so in a way, I'm always I'm always looking to be in a cave alone. But actually, my, my life, <laughs> I'm still waiting to get to the cave. You know, uh, but it, but, it, but so it's good. It was it was a nice adventure, a nice adventure. Um, I, I mean, I worked in three London parishes, 
um, and that, I mean they were they were all very different. Um, but did did you ever feel very challenged by situations in terms of you felt you wondered what you were doing there, or could you could you keep this sense of harmony and oneness always as the reference point during the, the difficult times and, and challenging situations you had to deal with? Well, I th I, I think. Uh, I think after about four years as a priest, I'd completely lost the plot. Actually, I think okay. I think I'd um, I'd forgotten why I'd gone into it, and I had to rediscover that. And I, I rediscovered it through um, through watching a candle. Uh, a candle was put out. <laughs> right. A candle was put out, and I was just looking at the smoke. And, the, and I, I I I love candles when they're alight, but I also love them when they're not alight, and when the smoke is just disintegrating and it's just returning to the air and it's and um, and and you just see that the, the oneness returning you know it's because it's quite distinctive at one point when it's coming up but then gradually it merges with everything else and I got a great sense of returning you know to the oneness again because I was I was forgetting that. I was too busy being a priest too busy being you know part of a church you know so you got involved with the organisation. Well, you can and, do. That's yeah. right, and and of yeah. course, because you know, a church in many ways is a business. You've got to keep the whole thing on. You've got to keep yeah. the show on the road, and it's not easy. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, I did. I think I did lost. I had. I had lost my way. I'd lost the. I'd lost the joy of it, uh, and I'd lost the joy of experiences of closeness with God as well. Uh, and it's funny what just comes along, and in a moment. I was reminded, and a great, you know, great sense of peace again. Um, and I think, you know, I'd lost again after about ten more years. So you, you, things come and go. You, I, I think, I, I found things. You lose, I lose them. I find them, I lose them. And I think that is the way. When you talk about the closeness with God, mm. what does that mean to you? Well, I think it's it's very related to the to the oneness. I think it's okay. I think it's the oneness. Um, so, so how do you see God as such? I don't, I don't, I don't really see God. I don't. Um, uh, I think now. I think, I think the Father image was a was a as, was an important image for me back then. You know, and uh, and certainly, you know, Jesus talks talks about the Father and the, the loving care of the Father. You know, who counts the hairs on your head and knows if a sparrow falls, and you know. I don't think that's a very that's a very strong that's a very strong image, but um, it may be that in the end every image has to be discarded because obviously in the end God is is indescribable, and if we describe God in a way we do God a disservice. So I'd probably move to um, to the place where I don't I don't try, I don't really try to talk about God. I don't even like talking about God very much yeah, actually. Okay. I'm a bit hesitant because. Um, um, but I think certainly in my life, I've I've picked along the way. I've picked up helpful images of God and lived with them until they've stopped being helpful, and then I've let them go. And I'm probably now in a place where uh, I don't I don't have him I don't have images, really. Because I know um, I say I know just reading your notes that you came to a point where I think you in stop after 20 years or yeah. maybe a bit before that yeah. where you realise you weren't enjoying being a priest anymore well it was it, more I think yes in a way ceased, I think there were words where it ceased to be an adventure it ceased to be an adventure that's, that's right I think I'd reached a point where um, uh, I was going to have to you know I'd been in a parish for 10 years and, and I think after 10 years you, you're probably about to become part of the problem as opposed to part of the solution and so it was time to probably time to move on and I just felt, actually, I don't want to start again doing this somewhere else. I think, and that, as you say, I felt the adventure was over, uh, which wasn't a pleasing feeling um, because I imagined I'd be doing this for the rest of my life and it's nice to have an income and it's nice to have a home and all those things, you know. Yes. And, uh, uh, but I realised that the adventure was over. It was, you know, it's like, you know, and I didn't know, I didn't know what to do next. I didn't know, I had no vision of what to do next. I didn't know what, what to do. Um, but I just knew I had to leave, and so I left. It is very brave to say I need to follow my truth, and well, yes, maybe it is. Maybe this is my George Best moment, being daring <laughs> and courageous. <laughs> he did it on the football pitch. I did it then. But uh, I, I, but it, in a way, it wasn't a choice because 
I couldn't do anything else, so I'm not sure if that is a choice. So you got to the point it was completely obvious it was, it was to time me. to move on, and yeah. it would be more difficult to stay what you were doing than, go, than face the unknown of a new adventure. Yeah, yeah. I knew I had to jump. It's like, you know, if there's a fire in your kitchen, yeah. you leave the kitchen. Yeah. You don't say, hmm, what am I going to do when I leave the kitchen? You just leave the kitchen because there's a fire. But some, not everyone does that. Right. Some people will stay they there. They stay in the kitchen and they, get, and they get burnt. Yeah. And it's sad. You see that a lot with people, that the fire has gone, whether it's from their relationship or their right. job or yeah. whatever, their hobbies, whatever, and they, they stay doing it because it's a habit. So, it is a habit. It's, yeah. it's safe. It is safe. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that... The next yeah. stage, I'm picking up a book. Oh here, yeah, picking a book. Because you actually yeah. went and got a job in a yeah. supermarket. I did. I mean, no one else has had me. Yeah. <laughs> Stacking shelves. Well, it was the fifth supermarket. I got turned down by four supermarkets. There can't be many people who've been turned down by four. So supermarkets. you would go in and you'd give them your CV. <laughs> yeah, you, could just, say, you could just see it dying. Doing? You yeah. could just see it dying. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't good. The, the only supermarket in the end who employed me would use psychometric testing on the phone. So. They didn't know I was a priest, so that was good. Um, that, I think that's the only reason why they employed me, because they didn't know I was a priest. It was all done. So the job interview was on the phone? It was a psychometric test, yeah, that's right. And it's I don't actually know what a psychometric oh, it, test oh, they is. Just ask you, they just ask you, in this situation, would you do this, this or that? You know, lots oh, of I questions see. like that, okay. which are, I suppose meant to provide some deep and profound psychological profile of you, um, and just to weed some people out, I suppose. So by the time, so if you got through that, then the supermarket, basically, then you just went along and said, yep, here I am. And uh, That's extraordinary. I didn't know this went on. So you actually, you go to a job and you haven't really actually met anyone. Well, to, I mean, to be fair to them, they, they, you do then go and have a sort of five-minute interview. But okay. it's the sort of interview where basically it's just a final weeding out because you've got through the main, you've yes. jumped the main okay. hurdle. So you do, you do meet with them for five minutes. I did have a five-minute interview in which... It did become apparent that I had been a priest, but it was okay by then because the psychometric testing had said I wasn't too weird. <laughs> <laughs> so you went from being a priest and yeah. you literally yeah. were stacking shelves, yeah. working in the till. Yeah. What else did you do there? Well, that was it, really. Actually, that's a pretty good summary. Oh, and also sort of skive in the warehouse, obviously. You know, the warehouse is where you go when you want a break from it. Okay. But, um, yeah, I did the news. I also did the news. I ran the newspaper section as well and the magazines. So, so yeah, yeah, uh, mainly the fruit and veg. So uh, I, I know a lot about fruit and veg, but I was always a little bit on the tills and, um, and the newspapers and the magazines. And you became the shop steward. I did become the, the shop steward, which was a further sort of dimension to us. So I did spend quite a lot of time sort of defending people at tribunals and whatever. Uh, yeah, and... Sort of because at the it's it's a fairly it's fairly sort of a feudal system in the supermarket where I was there there is management and there are workers and the workers that are fairly are treated fairly poorly and regarded as just really a pair of hands you know we don't have heads we don't have hearts we just have hands and uh, so when people found out that you used to be a priest how did they relate yeah. to you. Well, fortunately, I mean, I didn't ever tell anyone, so no one knew for at least a year. So by that time, they've, you're, you're just a human, normal human being. Right. And, uh, but I, I don't think people relate really any, any differently. Um, I mean, you, know, you, you take yourself wherever you go, and if you're, if you're wearing a dog collar, um, you're not a different person than if you're not wearing a dog collar. And, and, and if you're cold as a priest, you will be cold as a supermarket worker. If you're warm as a priest, you'll be warm as a supermarket worker. So I, don't, I didn't actually feel any different in, in relationships on the shop floor to just it, to being in a parish, really. So people were still drawn to you, presumably? Well, um, <laughs> who knows? You'd have to ask them. But it, I certainly, I mean, but I did have, people did talk a lot to me. Yes, they did talk a lot to me about things. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and obviously you're regarded by other people differently, you know, people see a supermarket worker and if they see a priest there's some sort of respect of some sort, whereas a supermarket worker they won't. So you're, you're, you're viewed externally differently, but actually by those who you relate to on the shop floor, it was no different from being in the parish really. Yeah. And how was your spiritual journey at this point? Did you feel it was on hold or did you feel 
there was movement, some deepening. No, not yeah, not not at all on hold. Um, I, I mean, a lovely, just a lovely sense of um, presentness, really. I, I would, I'd, or, uh, you know, I'd love, you know, you'd, you'd stand on, in the middle of the meat aisle. I'd, I, I don't know why I always was in the middle of the meat aisle, but it was, and you know, you just think, here I am now, standing here in the supermarket. I've got a job here. This is, I am the luckiest man in the world. You know, that's how I, that's how I felt <laughs> because it had been so hard to get a job. So you were grateful, basically. Oh, that's hugely grateful. Isn't yeah. that interesting? I just felt I was the luckiest. So, I'd, so many people, they think. Getting a job in a supermarket, it's not a very nice job and they're filling time. And here you were, you'd had a job as a priest, which yeah. is in some ways a very respected role in, yeah. in society. And you actually feel grateful and present being in a supermarket. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I felt the luckiest man. I did feel the luckiest man in the world. And um, I remember the thrill of when he gave me that, when he, when he actually said, yeah, we'll take you on. You know, that's a lot of punching the air <laughs> moment yeah I'm very proud I'm very proud and um uh so it was it was good it was good um uh i mean the the soup the the, the problems tend to be with as a as a as a shop steward as the shop steward in terms of you know handling the management because we did we had lots of conflicts you know but conflict is um, sometimes that is the way that is the way things advance and progress um I don't. I don't ever look forward to conflict, but um, it, it had to be there. So, I know one of the things that you told me earlier was that you'd been, you'd learned about the enneagram towards oh, the end yeah. of your priesthood, yeah. and you actually found that quite useful in the supermarket, understanding people. Do you want to just tell us very briefly what the enneagram system is? It's something that I I I, I find very useful in my life, right, yeah. and the and how you practically used it in the supermarket. Yeah. The Enneagram was, in, was first shown to me uh, about 25 years ago by a South African bishop on a silent retreat in North Wales. Um, so a nice sort of mixture of Africa, Wales, and um, because but the Enneagram is is a, is a way of um, uh, it's a, it is a way of understanding yourself. It's a way of and understanding other people, and um, it does something rather ridiculous to begin with because it actually divides the human race into nine different ways of being um, which which sounds completely mad until you actually step inside it and discover that it's entirely true um, but on the outside it does sound mad but it's 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 the Enneagram describes nine different ways of being nine different um, uh, nine different sort of uh, ways in which we can express the light and, and nine different ways in which we can express the darkness and within each of these ways of being there is genius and there is hideousness so that uh, to, to, to know what your number is because they number each of these ways of being one two three four five six seven eight or nine so you're one of these numbers um, and of course there isn't a good number and there isn't a bad number the only question is of whether you're a healthy version of your number or whether you're an unhealthy version um, and I, I was introduced to this 25 years ago and I just found it incredibly helpful for myself and then, as a priest, I began to you know, use it in, in the parish, and um, it's incredibly helpful in the parish, and of course, in, in the supermarket, it's incredibly helpful in the supermarket because it helps you to get inside somebody else's skin, which is, you know, is the ultimate, perhaps, you know, the ultimate challenge to stand in somebody else's shoes. Um, so you are able to have a feeling of what their type is. You understand their type you then understand what makes them tick and why they're saying and feeling certain things and then you can relate and empathise with them. Am I summing that correctly? Or? Yeah, that, 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 is, that is true. I mean, that's, that's a, a, positive, that's a positive take on it. Of course, okay. sometimes you just, you just feel the negativity of the number and you, and you don't feel very empathetic at all. You just feel, um, oh my goodness, here we go. <laughs> but it's absolutely true. In its purest form, of course, as soon as you understand somebody, you forgive them. Now, that's that's the, you know, as soon as you understand someone, you forgive them. Okay, I'm just, just looking if that's true in my life. Okay. As soon as you understand someone, you forgive them. I don't know for me whether there's a direct correlation between understanding and forgiving. Certainly, if I understand. So I'd have to think about that. Yeah. That's a very deep thing you're saying there. Well, it's. I suppose, yeah. I suppose behind it is the, 
is the sense that if you understand something, you understand where they where they've come yes, from that's and, true. and what's created them. Yes, um, you do you understand the dynamics behind it? Yes. Um, yeah. So can you give us? I don't want to pin you down here, yeah. but can you give us like a couple of examples in the supermarket how you had difficulty with situations and then using the enneagram you were able to to for yourself produce understanding and and um, and move on from the situation, forgiveness? Well, I mean, uh, um, the, 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 we had various managers, but the, the, the manager I spent most of the time there with uh, um, was a very frightened, he was a very frightened man. And um, we were meant to, you know, we were, we were meant to have, you know, we were meant to have weekly meetings, but he, 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 he was always running away from these because he didn't, he didn't like he didn't like to be pinned down. He didn't like to focus. I mean, I was always trying to encourage you to, to help him to feel safe about the weekly meeting. I never succeeded actually. He was always he was always too frightened, and uh, he was a man who was running away from everything. His enneagram. I, I won't talk about his enneagram number because it'd probably be meaningless here. But I mean, he sounds like a number six to me. No, he was he was no. number seven. Okay, Sorry, he was okay. number seven. He was number seven. But it was just you're just you're just aware of the forces that are working inside him. Yes. To, to see that actually something doesn't happen. Um, yes. And uh, I mean, ultimately, you know, that is that is that's that's frustrating in the moment. But as you as you say, you know, as you, as you stand back and you know, you can you can understand and you can understand why this is so. And there's not actually much in that situation I could do about it. I could just watch this, you know, dysfunction working its way out in his life. Um, and uh, he didn't. He he wasn't. He wasn't ready to deal with it, and certainly not from a member of, you know, a lowly member of his team. So you've you've written this book, one of your many books called the Enneagram. Yeah. And you've written this. The subtitle is a private session with the world's greatest psychologist. Yeah. And you've basically written it as if you were the Enneagram. Yes. Which is it quite is. an original idea. Well, right? it's original, and, I, and whether it works or not, I don't know. Some people like it very much, and some people hate it. So it's a, it's a bit of a gamble. But I think I wanted to write a slightly sort of different sort of enneagram book because you know there are there are one or two very good enneagram books out there, and I wanted to write something with a slightly sort of different, um, a slightly sort of different feel to it. But yeah, it's the same. They are the same truths inside. But I think it's this. I think it's this. It's that moment when the enneagram stops being something. Oh, that sounds interesting. A bit like a sort of a party game and actually directly addresses someone and then ah oh, my goodness i'm involved in this and and then and then that's when it feels like you're on the psychiatrist chair then because you're really you are really involved in this in this, this relationship between you and the enneagram and it's quite nice because in a way although some people are very threatened when they talk to another person because they think oh i can't admit that or i can't say that actually when you're dealing with the enneagram it's quite the impersonal nature of it i think makes enables some people to feel more truthful about themselves um, because it is like you are sitting with somebody who's analyzing you down to the last thing yeah. but actually it's it's also impersonal in that there's no judgment there because it's just it's just these truths this is these truths are out there so I think it's it's uh, it is a wonderful way to work and so that I think it does feel like a private session with the world's greatest psychologist because I think the Enneagram is the world's greatest psychologist and uh, it actually the Enneagram has something to say to you, and so I wanted to sort of personalise it and make it sound like it's just, you know, here we are talking, you, you and the Enneagram. So now you, you left, after a few years, I think three years, yeah, you left yeah. the supermarket, and obviously you felt that adventure was ending, it's time to move on, and now you basically, you lead retreats, yes. and you write. Yes, yeah. Um, tell us a bit and what I, you do now. Yes, well, I, I, I what suppose on your retreats. Um, yes, I, um, I do. I mean, I, uh, I do retreats. I do write, and I sort of see people come to see me as well. So that's probably the sort of three, the three things that uh, I do. Um, the retreats, they vary because sometimes I do enneagram. Sometimes I do enneagram retreats, um, in which people, you know, come on, wondering, you know, what number am I? And um, that's uh, those are quite hard work. And um, sometimes I do retreats around the beautiful life, my book, the beautiful life. Yes, um, this one but we here, use those, yeah. and those are slightly longer, slightly longer retreats, yes. and involve more silence and more reflection, uh, and involve a little bit of input. 
and a little bit of talk and a little bit of quiet. And so, yeah, they're, they're different sorts. Sometimes the retreats are one day, sometimes they're five days. And I suppose depending on what the length of time it matters. The nice thing about doing a f something like a five-day retreat is that you can you can risk more because you can you can allow people um, you can allow people to go into a dark place and there's time for them to come out of it. But a, a one-day retreat or a two-day retreat, you can't you can't allow that because you can't leave someone um, you can't leave someone broken. So what does being in a dark place mean? Well, I think, um, you know, the human personality has been created out of um, negative experiences in our past. Now, we just take that, we take our personality for granted. We take our personality as something that's, that's going to get us through life and is going to make us happy and get us, make us rich or whatever. Of course, our personality can never make us happy because it was created out of... Um, uh, negative experiences in our past. Our personality is created out of negative. It, it's our personality is created out of our anger, out of our anxiety, and out of our fear. It's like a construct. It is. It is a. Yeah. It is a construct. It's not who we are. But you know, um, so and so. What I'm sorry, I'm talking about dark places. If you're going to ask someone to dis, to such to say, well, why are you the person who you are? And then that's that's when you go into dark, frightening places because you think, well, actually, my goodness, this is this isn't who I thought I was, you know, and and that's that's very upsetting and dismantling for people. Uh, and and it's it's uh, it's a good place to go, but it's also very important that you that you're helped to come out of there as well, and you're not left there, you know, struggling by yourself. And so, at a longer retreat, that's possible, and a short retreat, it's not possible. So, who are we really? Well, I think we're rather, we're very happy. I think the most important thing is we're very happy people, and we're people who are at one with everyone else, because we are our, our essence, our essential selves. You know, when we are born, you know, we are we are we are you know that we are trusting, we are at one with the world, we merge with everything. But of course, what our personality does, it comes and it hardens us and it separates us off in some ways in order to protect us. And that does it. You know, one one of the reasons why the enneagram is so insightful is it it, it it reveals to us the different ways in which human beings separate themselves off from themselves, from other people, from the world, and we do it in different ways. But we do it, and we do it to, to survive. We do it to protect ourselves. We get you know, and so and then of course as we grow up, we imagine this is who we truly are. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? You know, it's like asking a fish to describe water. Yeah. A fish can't describe water because actually it's been in it all its life. And, and in the same way, we can't describe our personality because we've been in it all our life. And so we just assume this is who we are. And then someone insightful comes along, like the Enneagram, and says, actually, no, that, look, look why you do that. Look at what you're doing. Why do you do that? And then that's when the whole the pack of cards begins to collapse. And that can be a very challenging process when the pack of cards starts to collapse. Yes, it's it? a very challenging. I mean, it, and it only it, 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 in life, I, I think it's it, 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 either, it, it only happens in crisis, or it happens when you deliberately, you know, take yourself away on retreat, you know, yeah. and, and risk that, risk that. So it does take a bit of courage to go away on a longer retreat, knowing that that it's thing the first might thing, start to wobble a bit. Absolutely, it's the first thing I always say to people on retreat. You know, I said, "You are the bravest of the brave." Yeah. You know, some people, and I say that because some people will look on retreats and say, oh, you know, oh, yeah, wishy-washy, oh, he goes away on retreats. And they, they sort of rather sort of as if it's, you know, if you can't cope with life, oh, okay, if that's what you need. But actually, it's it's the profoundest coping of, with life, and it's the bravest of people who go on retreats um, because they're risking. They're risking the silence they were, they were to return to the nothingness. They're risking the nothingness. Yeah. And, Is uh, there a difference between silence and nothingness for you? Well, um, uh, it depends what you're doing with the silence. I mean, it's, it's like these words in themselves mean nothing. I mean, you could be sitting there in silence judging your neighbour, in which case it's a very noisy silence. Or you could be sitting there in silence, in true silence, which is the stillness of uncreatedness. And that is, that is, the, that is true silence. So we, in a sense, silence, it depends what the quality of the silence is. If, we, if we're sitting there um, remembering yesterday how we got irritated by so-and-so and then thinking of a really good line we should have said in order to get back at them, that is not silence. That's, 
That's busyness. That's noise. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if it's a two silence, there's a lovely sense of uncreatedness about it, and we're, you know, back to the sense of emptiness of, of nothingness. And uh, if that's there, that's that that is the I, that's very similar, I think, to nothingness to the theme of nothingness for me. And is that a place you rest in? It is. It is a place I rest in. Yeah, yeah. If, um, um, when I'm when I'm when I'm feeling trusting, when I'm trusting the universe, yeah, I can rest there. If I don't trust the universe, I don't want to be there because I want to be running around, scurrying around, judging someone or uh, or arranging something for to happen or planning something or whatever. But if I trust the universe, if I trust that this is a kind universe, this is a kind place, if I trust that, then I can sit in emptiness and uh, in silence. And what pulls you in and out of that space? Um, well, I think there's a season... I think there's a season for everything. I think we all have to we all have to leave that space. You know, um, I mean, if I take the to take the life of Jesus, I mean, you know, Jesus would often disappear off to pray in the mountains. He would disappear off, and um, but then at other times he was in the midst of a maelstrom of religious dispute or crowds wanting him to do this, that, or the other. So you know, a life of huge action, but also a life of withdrawal. And so I suppose it's just looking at our lives and allowing for that, allowing for the cycle, because you know life is action and and inaction. It's it's, it's the balance, and uh, so, um, but it's when it's when the emptiness, it's when the inaction goes. That's that's the problem. Yeah, the term I've always loved, which I read many years ago, is about being man in the world, but not of the world. Yeah, that's so a, that's about a nice... being, and I love being in the marketplace. I love yeah being in business yeah. and doing conscious TV and all kinds yeah. of different things. And there's always a challenge there, which a <laughs> challenge is it comes and comes and goes in its intensity of can I actually be the man in the world but not drawn into all the dramas of the world? Yeah. And that, for me, somehow is a true hermit. Hermit's probably not a very good word, but somehow is true balance where... OK, it is sometimes for certain people comparatively easy. I'm just reading here that you're saying you're a failed hermit. A failed hermit, that's just right. Just reminding me of that. That's but right, yeah. No, that's absolutely true. And I think you can be you can be in your cave in a crowd, if you see what I mean. Yes. Uh, uh, I don't, that's, and I think that's... And I think that very strong, obviously, the, at the heart of that is, is, is being present, isn't it? And I think as soon as you're present, as soon as you're present to a moment whether it's a board meeting, a football match, or standing in the, in the meat aisle of the supermarket, as long as you're present at that moment, you are, you are in your cave. You are, um, you are strong uh, in this moment, um, you are, and you're not caught up in what's happening. You're, 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 you're involved in it, but as you say, you're not caught up in it. You're the man of, you, you're the man of the world, and not in, but in the world, but not of the world. And... Uh, so yeah, because in in the present you're free, and in the present no one has a has their hooks in you. Nothing has their hooks in you in the present. We've got about three or four minutes left. I'm really interested in in finishing. First of all, I want you to read a, another page from your book, but I'd just like to talk very briefly a little bit more about being in the present. And I know there isn't really a how, but what are the the aids, if you like? What are the tools that you use to help you? To remind you being in the present. Um, breathing, I think breathing is a very is a very helpful one because. So, is it breathing awareness of breathing? Well, awareness of breathing because the great thing about our breathing is that even though our heads are very rarely in the present, our breathing is always in the present. Mm. So, when we leave our heads and just allow ourselves to listen to our breathing, that's a very practical tool for becoming present because. Our breathing is present, and it's always it's going on all the time in the present. And so, I think as as a first step, as a first practical step, I think that to try to um, listen to our breathing, and of course, once we tune into our breathing, we then our thoughts then begin to run off into different directions. But we we allow that, we acknowledge them, we say, oh, okay, we're thinking of that. Now we're thinking of that. Thank you. Now let's get back to our breathing. And so we just gradually gradually focusing on our breathing I think that's that's the perhaps the for me is the first most helpful step when I'm when I'm thinking about um, being present 
uh, if I'm struggling, if I'm struggling, I think sometimes it comes quite easily. A lovely, a lovely awareness, a lovely awareness of the presence with acceptance. I think acceptance is very important. You can't be present if you don't accept what's happening. Hmm. So a lovely awareness of the present with acceptance. Um, and so if there's something that you're not accepting, something you're refusing to accept, acknowledge that. And then go back to your breathing again. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to ask you just to finish the program by reading another page from your oh, yeah. latest book, One Minute yeah. Mystic, which is called Particle Physics on the Train, which I really liked. So. Oh, right, yeah. Right, yeah, so it's an interesting choice, this one, aren't you? Right. Particle Physics on the Train. I try and notice something new every day because new things are very polite. They wait to be asked before making an appearance. Today, as I am reading a journal left on the train, my eyebrows are raised in surprise. As the train passes through fields and farmsteads, I am reading about particle physics and discovering that when viewed with extreme magnification, matter shows itself to be made up mostly of space. This is true even of bricks and iron girders, which have always seemed to me quite solid. I've been mistaken, however. When a brick is placed under the magnifying glass, solidity and permanence are revealed to be illusions and spacious fluidity is confirmed. I'm so engrossed in all this that I miss the coffee trolley passing through. I'm irritated, but then allow my initial reaction to become less solid. As with bricks, there is a surprising amount of space in our emotions. They are much less solid than we imagine. I leave the journal on the train, as someone left it for me. Others may need to know about our spacious universe. Yeah, that's nice. That's, it's, it's, one of the things about me is I, when I've, when I've written something, I forget it instantly. And so when I read something like that, I'm reminded of it. So it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it touches, it touches me. Yeah, it touches yeah, me. So cool. I, like the, I like the idea of spacious emotions, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, which I think is uh, but not solid, not solid. Simon, really thank you for coming along to Conscious TV. I've really enjoyed it. We've had, a, I think, a very interesting chat. You've had a fascinating life. Thank you. And it's, it's been lovely to be here. Thank you. And thank you for uh, watching again Conscious TV and just to remind you of uh, Simon's latest book, One Minute Mystic. And I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.